Takže dobrý den. Ta moje prezentace se týká Concerns the um, economic um, practice, economic situation, and you actually raised quite a lot of issues which uh, should have been added to my presentation. So I will at least mention them to link my presentation uh, more to what you've said so far. I will not be speaking in uh, uh, detail about uh, the big crisis we just celebrated in inverted. In Thomas, 10 years um, after the beginning of the big crisis at the end of uh, 2008, but it was most intense in the world of finance. I don't think it originated in uh, um, and the world of finance. Uh, I think it was elsewhere, and I will try to indicate where I think it was, but uh, the fundamental problems uh, were definitely in the real economy, not, not the financial um, part of it. In the U.S., um, economy was uh, heavily financed. Um, being heavily financed, that means the um, um, financial sector is uh, abundant, uh, uh, new players, new banks, Hedging funds, uh, voucher funds, uh, um, all types of uh, tools like this, and um, being over uh, uh, overly uh, um, financially dependent, it means that the financial sector is uh, acquiring um, um, wider share on GDP, and it's becoming a problem. The debt, which was uh, one of the key symptoms of the big uh, crisis, um, uh, became one of the potential one of the potential solutions of problems in the real economy, especially very low. Uh, um, ability of uh, the public to uh, buy what uh, people need to buy. Um, and well became an issue. Well means that uh, you own assets and it may be a house you have a mortgage on and you expect uh, that house to be um, gaining on value. People tend to believe it. I'll buy this and it will double its value in a couple of days. You are waiting um, for your situation to improve. Not that your income is higher, but you've bought a house and uh, the uh, value of the house is growing exponentially. And that's a problem because uh, it will never last. But wealth is uh, very sexy. And the real economy was not able to increase the uh, um, living as far as people expected it. So what happened in between then and now? Have, are we moving in the right uh, direction? Maybe in, on the academic level, yes, but in, in respect of policies, no. How did we react to crisis? Panovalo poměrně minimálně retoricky silné odhodlání. 
businesses were and, can, and governments uh, decided not to hamper uh, free trading. Uh, they competitively devalued, uh, 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 most countries competitively devalued uh, their um, currencies, uh, um, but it didn't lead to any conflict. Always, when uh, um, times are going bad, you can apply or several solutions. And, and fiscal policy uh, has many tools that can come into play, but it didn't happen in um, um, 2008. T20 was really very much into it at the beginning, but it didn't take long for uh, G20 to lose concert, and there were many dissenting opinions amongst the members of how to tackle uh, the crisis. The US, um, um, they uh, um, were doing much better in solving the problem than Europe. Uh, the U.S. nationalized, de facto uh, uh, nationalized a number of financial institutions and uh, uh, businesses, so the taxpayer didn't suffer as much as uh, um, they did in Europe. So the initial reaction in the U.S., given the circumstances wasn't that bad really the the initial uh, um, emergency solution was quite proper um, including the takeover of uh, uh, some of the uh, banks in the EU under the German uh, pressure decided to go for austerity measures it was probably one of the biggest mistakes of the decade. Um, it uh, worsened the situation and the social catastrophe um, didn't take uh, uh, long to uh, surface, like Greece, for example. Greece lost hundreds of thousands of young people who just decided to leave the country, and that's a real problem. So the fiscal reaction was either weak or just the opposite. Um, austerity measures are a good example. We remember it, and the austerity uh, uh, measures, they made the situation even worse, and uh, they made people suffer for much longer. So monetary policy was uh, um, the one to suffer the most. We can tell today that the uh, monetary policy cannot handle uh, uh, such pressure for many reasons. The central bank uh, um, has tools available to it, but doesn't use the tools properly. And uh, we, are, we keep talking about um, financial aspects without going to the depth of the problem. So what happened? Monetary, the monetary policy became extreme. What I mean by extreme, just not standard. In uh, um, economic textbooks, uh, you don't see anything like that. If you look at macroeconomy books, um, you will uh, not find measures like that, like uh, negative interest rates, maybe in Switzerland, but not anywhere else. And suddenly, uh, all these extreme measures became a norm. Japan, the Great Britain, the US, and also the uh, EU, the European Central Bank. Um, this policy had a lot of objectives to uh, um, buy bad assets from the banks, uh, um, stabilize the banks, etc. Um, the central bank uh, um, and its balance doesn't have any economic um, value. But commercial banks had to become healthy and um, states decided to devalue their currencies 
but it's not about solving fundamental problems. It's just about uh, um, solving one thing to the detriment of the other. Uh, quantitative uh, uh, relief also uh, um, caused the um, interest rates to drop to below zero, actually. Negative uh, um, interest rates are not standard. It's a specific measure. It's a, a crazy measure, so to speak. Banks will be lending money instead of sitting on it, in inverted uh, commas, uh, to uh, allow for flow of money. But if there is no demand, uh, uh, why this offer? So monetary policy was under heavy pressure, and Mario Draghi, uh, very far from a progressive uh, uh, politician, had to finally conclude that uh, um, monetary policy is under heavy pressure. Uh, he was pushing for, uh, for for structural reforms so that people can be laid off easily, uh, countries can save here and there. He realized uh, um, quite late that um, wages were not growing and that the monetary policy cannot solve the problem. It can bail it, you know, it can sort of cover it with a veil, but that would be about it. And of course, uh, bubbles popped up here and there. Um, assets uh, were artificially increasing in uh, value, real estate bubbles and other bubbles. Um, it didn't take long for them to surface. So um, negative interest rates became a norm, uh, Eurozone and Japan um, um, and um, some smaller economies uh, um, decided to go for negative interest rates uh, uh, to um, get um, inflation under control and to prevent the currency from becoming too strong, like what the Swiss uh, um, often do. But um, the economic situation was very specific, and the standard monetary tools were not working in this new situation. So uh, yes, the uh, uh, several countries, or, or Eurozone, for example, resorted to measures which were definitely non-standard, and it was not wise. Philip's uh, curve, uh, you can find it in every um, economic textbook, but it is uh, not valid anymore. Central bankers really like it. It's the inflation to unemployment ratio. Um, uh, and um, banks uh, should pay proper attention to this. They often say that if unemployment is low, uh, wages will go up and it will reflect in growing inflation. So that's a very uh, um, uh, standard thinking of banks towards uh, um, inflation handling. Phillips curve that looks like this in textbooks um, has fallen apart. That's the picture to the right. It's uh, it flattened. It's it's not a curve, and uh, the relation is no longer there. Wages to um, um, unemployment to inflation. Many countries with low unemployment, uh, um, like the U.S don't show any uh, um, wage growth and the inflation pressure comes from somewhere else, like in the States it comes from Europe. And uh, in the recent, say, 18 months, uh, certain uh, um, um, central bankers are talking about wages. Fed, the U.S. Fed keeps monitoring the uh, job market, but with the European Central Bank, it's an exception that the bank would actually follow the development of uh, wages, the growing of uh, curve of wages, and saying that it's not uh, uh, 
proper. They, uh, I think they're tackling the fundamental problem now. So, uh, coming to the... Coming to the question of the debt, I have uh, some bits and pieces from an IMF uh, statistic uh, from various sources, actually. But uh, even though the numbers may vary, the trend is quite visible. After 2008, uh, debt did not go down. On the contrary, it has gone up, although there have been shifts between countries and sectors. We can say that the total global uh, debt is over 200% of the global product. All things made on our planet uh, within one year. Two-thirds of that is private, one-third is public, and uh, the, most of the debt is in the developing countries, uh, in the developed countries, and China is joining the ranks of the developed countries and joining the high debt uh, family. So, uh, who is leading? United States have always uh, been leading, uh, followed by Japan, also no surprise, and now China. Uh, Trump's reform in the United States uh, and the continuous uh, defense spending uh, will uh, run up a huge deficit of public finance, so public debt of the United States will go up, that's for sure. Even though debt reduction has been a lot of, a lot on the table and it's been widely talked about that we must reduce debt, etc., debt uh, un under the radar, but debt increased, obviously some countries had problems like Greece did, but uh, overall uh, the, the debt has increased all over the world. That invites questions. Can a uh, modern economy work, uh, well, not without debt, it's already uh, certain that it cannot work without debt, but uh, can it survive without a perpetual increasing uh, the debt? So the blue uh, represents uh, developed economies. You can see that the poorest countries are not even on the map. That means uh, on a global scale, they do not uh, pose a problem. You know, everyone says about the poor countries, they, they are drowning in debt, uh, etc. And they're not even showing up on this. And you can see China coming in a big way. And you can see the upward curve, the ball, the big ball uh, that we are dragging on our legs uh, is getting bigger and bigger. So the question again, can uh, our economy work without perpetually increasing the debt? I have, I have serious doubts about it. I think we always have to uh, take out more and more debt in order to keep going. What are the present risks? Oh, if I may just revisit uh, the, the question of money, just to follow up on the earlier presentation. It's true that it, within the academic circles, uh, there is a lot more uh, discussion about what is money, what is uh, what is the central bank's role and what do the private banks do? Uh, there has been a lot of uh, interest in this uh, in these questions after 2008, and uh, people are busily researching and discussing 
what should be what should be done. Uh, the Swiss referendum, although it failed, introduced or placed on the map uh, the four gelt uh, uh, option, a complete revolution uh, of in money making. So everything, all money making would be in the hands of, of uh, the central bank. On the academic level, uh, there is a lot of interesting discourse going on. Uh, ideas are fermenting and breathing. Even the Stiglitz report after 2008 uh, introduced uh, many interesting new and fresh angles uh, and viewpoints on the financial world. But in the economic policy, everything is, as always was, a very little change very little development even Martin Wolf uh, uh, fi financial the Financial Times uh, uh, chief commentator he is not a particularly uh, progressive person uh, I have to admit that uh, very few lessons have been learned by economic practitioners uh, well, the people who are in power, the people who are incumbent, they do not want to change. Why would they? Because they would be undermining their own interests. Uh, there are many interesting uh, ideas being proposed that go to the core of the problem. What is money making? Uh, how does money making work? What is money, etc. You don't hear a lot about it here, but uh, uh, if you... Uh, on the inside of the academic circles, and perhaps you would you would see that uh, we discuss those issues as, as well. So uh, the United States plays a leading role in the financial world. The, Uni the USA is very dominant, and the United States uses its dominant position over Iran imposing sanctions. What is not good and what are the risks? Uh, the risks are that the United States introduced some forms of uh, financial sector regulation. Uh, but it's always patching up the biggest problems, not the systemic uh, change. Uh, the the United States has a lot of uh, credit default uh, swaps that are not uh, covered. Uh, credit default swap, default swap is a derivative instrument uh, where you basically speculate on the cases where you don't have a, an insurance interest. Let's say I would gamble on this burning uh, on this building burning down it's a highly risky uh, form of speculative behavior outlawed in some countries the other thing that is quite dangerous for the united states economy stability is the option buybacks or uh, share option buybacks or share buybacks. Uh, a lot of it is funded through leverage, uh, through corporate debt. Basically, that's uh, a gift that Trump, uh, Trump dropped into their labs. They use, uh, the corporations use uh, debt finance to buy back their own shares, not to increase wages or something. And the, the US dollar and the Fed policy uh, has a global impact. Every time the interest rates in the United States start going up, the capital flows around the whole world are affected. We know that very well. We have a group of vulnerable countries that always take the first hit. Uh, Turkey and Argentine are the two most recent examples. They are basically the early uh, canaries that take the blow. And uh, in the second line, we have uh, countries that are dependent on FDIs. So as soon as uh, uh, 
the the American capital is called back home, uh, those countries start uh, having problems. It's a signal of these countries having long-term systemic problems, not always due to their own doing, uh, and they are hi highly vulnerable. Those countries can uh, get the whole domino going. I mean, the last uh, crisis started in Thailand, not an economically important country, but, uh, you know, look what happened. Obviously, people have been saying that another crisis is looming, but uh, I don't want to scaremonger, but uh, let's see what the risks are. As, as of now, the fundamental economic problems are uh, still here as they ever have been. They have been only temporarily uh, obscured or, or uh, camouflaged by uh, more debt. So the snowball is getting bigger and the new risks have emerged. Uh, synchronized uh, conjuncture and uh, prosperity uh, will um, be over, for which we have, you know, something which we have been uh, enjoying for the past few years. That everybody, uh, everywhere, was basically doing good. All countries were doing good. So that uh, is now ending. Uh, there will be. Uh, an increased risk of uh, or increased uncertainty in, in the United States, in, in the U.S. Uh, uh, commercial policies, and uh, there will be political sanctions. U.S. politics uh, is primarily geopolitical. It has geopolitical goals, not uh, economic. So what Trump is proposing uh, would uh, greatly jeopardize uh, commercial flows all over the world. It would cause manufacturing capacities to shift. Um, obviously, the geopolitical tensions around the world that we are seeing today is not helping. The oil market, well, uh, oil hit the $18 per barrel mark yesterday, so you can see where it's headed. Um, a very threatening risk is uh, the tendency to uh, shift towards restrictive monetary policy, to abandon quantitative easing and go back to what was considered normal before. But how do uh, we do that? Uh, first, how to, how, to, how to manage this exit strategy so that it's accepted uh, across the board? And is it at all possible? The economy, the economy uh, may not be uh, fit to um, accept and absorb uh, significant interest rate increases, etc. So we are a small market, uh, but it could lead uh, to bubbles bursting, and we are back where we started. People will start defaulting. You know, it's very easy to maintain and carry debt when you have negative interest rate and you can refinance at any point you wish. And it's easy to be in debt. Let's take Italy in the Eurozone. It Italy, now with a new government being in power, it will be slightly more difficult, but it's easy for Italy to refinance its debt. But quantitative easing is uh, ending at the EIB level at the end of this year. Uh, 
there will be risk premium, premiums applied. So how will Italy manage? Uh, Italy accounts for 17% of the Eurozone. And it's just one country. And there will be many more countries that will find it very difficult to refinance their debt. Even the United States may uh, suffer. So all these problems are headed fast in our way, I guess, and they uh, reveal that the the problems lying deeper under the surface have never been tackled, that they, be, they were only camouflaged. Uh, reflection on uh, the policy is very uh, poor. It's true that the academics are start talking about uh, central banks, central banks policy, uh, inequality. You know, we see the have has published reports that inequality is rising, inequality is bad, something must be done. But uh, very little of that uh, is actually taken up uh, in the form of policies. Something would, something else would need to happen. Somebody else would need to be in power. Somebody who uh, would lend an ear to all this. So foreign policies and systemic uh, problems that led to uh, the last uh, Great Recession have not been uh, resolved. Uh, they were only camouflaged. Uh, the debt has been rising. And this is where the crux of the matter lies. And we are seeing that in the majority of uh, the developed countries. I mean, this has been ongoing since the 1970s. You can see uh, the scissors between productivity and wages uh, widening, opening. This is very poignant uh, uh, with respect to our reality. Uh, labor is a marginalized factor. The gap is huge and getting bigger and somebody is taking the up that space so it's not going to be a profit it will be annuity which is even worse and this is a, a different picture telling us the same message in all uh, developed countries, the uh, wage share and labor income share uh, have been dropping, which means uh, out of what is made, uh, few, uh, small and smaller part uh, uh, go towards wages and uh, more and more of it goes towards profits and annuities. So the purchasing power is lagging behind, uh, mo uh, motivating people to take on debt because they just want to uh, cover up this uh, discrepancy. You can see what happens when somebody proposes that something be done about wages. Then I will just say three things and then I finish. First, the wealth effect. Uh, make households take on debt, get a mortgage, buy a house and speculate that its price will carry on growing, which it will not. Uh, second, uh, the effect which became apparent in Germany, much criticized by Oscar Lafontaine, uh, we would increase the wages by uh, reducing uh, taxes, but obviously you will have to pay more out of the welfare fund. Uh, labor in the, uh, in the United Kingdom uh, yesterday came, uh, proposed that uh, employee ownership be a priority, but that again is still just another form of distributing capital income. That does not address the wages per se. So uh, some, there are pressures to drive down the wages.
To je to, proč neexistuje rozpojení. And the scissors between wages and the labor market and inflation are, uh, are widening because this is the, where the uh, crux of the problem lies. Unless we address this directly, we will always be looking for uh, some camouflage or cosmetic solutions. Um, but they are always only short term, and the problem will always come back to like a boomerang and even stronger. The real economy will always win. So this will come back uh, to, like a boomerang to hit us on the head.